Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the fifth She Opened the Door Ask the Expert series. I'm Cassandra Ziegler, 17 TC and 25 SEPA, and member of the She Opened the Door Leadership Committee and co-chair of the Ask the Expert series. This series features Columbia alumni speaking about their experiences, challenges, and achievements in an interactive setting with audiences from across the globe. I'm now pleased to introduce our moderator, Donna McPhee, 89CC, Vice President for Alumni Relations and President of the Columbia Alumni Association, and our speaker, Heidi Yang. Heidi joined Christie's as Global Managing Director for Asian and World Art in January, 2021. Prior to that, she spent 28 years in the financial sector, where she was the head of corporate finance at various investment banks and was a specialist in mergers and acquisitions, as well as public offerings for major corporations such as AIA, Graph, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, and Bank of China. Yang was also a board member at Deutsche Securities Asia Limited, supervisor for Zon Securities, and a member of the Hong Kong Stock Exchange Listing Committee. She is currently the independent non-executive director of 3S Bio, which is a listed company on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. She grew up in Hong Kong and lived in the US from 1989 to 2001 when she relocated back to Hong Kong. She holds a BA in economics and pre-med from Columbia University. Near the end of today's conversation, we will have an open Q&A. Throughout the discussion, you can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit a question. Donna, I now turn it over to you and Heidi for what's sure to be a very engaging conversation. Thank you both for being here. Thank you, Cassandra, and welcome, Heidi. Um, it's uh, what time Heidi is joining us from Hong Kong, and it's such a pleasure um, to have you here for our where she opened the door community. Um, I am uh, coming from Art Basel for, with our alumni community here in Miami, so this is truly a worldwide program. Um, so Heidi, how how's it going in Hong Kong, and what time is it? Just to give everyone some context. Oh, Heidi, you're muted. Hi. Hi, everyone. And thanks, Donna. I'm very happy to be here. Yes, I'm in Hong Kong, and it is now 1.15 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> well, that is so a true, that's a true blue Colombian for staying up, because I'm assuming you're not usually up at this time. Um, so thank you so much. We're so appreciative. So Heidi, we listened to your bio. However, we want the inside scoop, how you navigated your career, starting with your education at Columbia and um, through the finance industry and certainly now at Christie's. So please share more. Sure. Um, to make the answer very short is I have no idea what I was going to do, <laughs> except that I thought that I would be a doctor um, as Cassandra has mentioned, I was actually a pre-med and economics major when I was at Columbia. So my heart was all set on being a doctor someday. Um, but no, things happened. In fact, before I went to Columbia, I got into the medical school in Hong Kong. Um, but I applied to Columbia at the same time and I got so lucky that, you know, got accepted. Thought that there would be, you know, once in a lifetime experience to do something totally different since I grew up in Hong Kong and I haven't been outside of Hong Kong. Um, maybe I should give it a try. And that was a quite an interesting time in Hong Kong back then. It was 1989 when a lot of things were happening in the world. So I thought, why don't I just try something totally different? Um, so after I went to Colombia, in fact, I was still holding my space. Uh, for medical school in Hong Kong, thinking that if I don't like it, you know, I will be coming back right away. I can get a one-way ticket and not going back to New York anymore. And obviously, I didn't do that. And I decided to stay in New York and finish my degree at Columbia. And I was still doing a prima, thinking that one day I will be a doctor. Um, and it was, I think, summer. Yeah, it was summer in my junior year. 
and I went into the Korea office with my friend. It's really one of those stories, as you know, that you, you, you did something with a friend and decided that, you know, you are at the one ended up doing it. So I saw this uh, marketing ad on the um, bulletin board saying that there is a position on Wall Street. I have no idea what is Wall Street, but there was this little sign saying how much they will be paying for an intern. I was like, mm, that's very interesting. I have no idea what it is, but I should give it a try. So I applied to that position and I got in. So I did my internship on Wall Street for my junior year. And after that, they gave me an offer to come back. I was like, no, 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 I'm not going to stay on Wall Street. I'm going to be a doctor. So I'm still going to apply. And they kept sending me flowers, literally flowers, like in the height of up to my waist, to my dormitory. Can you imagine that, you know, this bouquet of flowers keep coming every day to the dorm? People thought that this must be from my boyfriend, a secret boyfriend that I never reviewed. No, but it's actually from a bank. Um, so I was like, mm, maybe I should give it a try because, you know, um, you know, there's no big deal. After two years, I can still go back to medical school. Um, obviously, I didn't. <laughs> I stayed in a bank. And I since then, I have been, you know, working in the financial industry for 28 years. I started my financial, um, my first finance job on Wall Street, and I stayed there for about 10 years. And one day I got a call from a boss and say, hey, I'm going to ship you out to Hong Kong. I said, what for? <laughs> we are going to build our office there and we need Mandarin speaker, a Cantonese speaker, anyone who can speak Chinese, we would like them to go out to Hong Kong because there is a business booming there. So I went to Hong Kong in actually first in 1997. I didn't really like it um, because the office was really, really small. I think that, you know, all the things that I can learn in New York is a lot more than I could do in Hong Kong. So I actually requested a transfer back to New York and I did after one year. And then a few years later, again, they said, well, you have to go out to Hong Kong. This time it's for real. You know, things are really doing well there and we want you to go. So I came back to Hong Kong in 2001. And since then, I stayed here because, as he said, things were doing really well in Asia. And um, the financial industry was um, really developing. Um, so I decided to stay in Hong Kong. And I stayed in the financial industry until three years ago and uh, I was actually doing this for such a long time that I was like mm, am I going to retire as a banker or am I going to do something different and I thought that I would just be a banker because I have a family you know things are doing so well and I have a family to take care of if I switch to a new job not talking about switch industry even switch to a new job to another bank it would be quite a burden because when you go into a new environment, you have to work with a new group of people. You have to put in a lot of effort and you have to invest a lot of um, a lot of time into it as well. So this thing has always crossed my mind, um, but it's actually, you know, I, I, I never put it into action. Even when people call me and say, are you interested to come to, you know, um, to our bank? I would say, no, 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 no. You know, maybe someday when when I get really bored and when I have the time, I would think about it. And then it came COVID. You know, during COVID, um, you know, we stayed at home. I have a lot of time to think of what I wanted to do. Um, and I got this call about, you know, Christie's. And I was like, you call the wrong person. <laughs> you know, I like arts and I will go around and appreciate arts, but I really do not know what it is. And I have seen a lot of things up at an auction house, but other than having like a man, you know, hanging up, you know, the gavel and trying to put it down and say, done you know and um i have no idea what it is um but because again this is covid right so i have a lot of free time not doing anything at home and they convinced me to just you know meet more people online everything was online there was no in-person meeting i met a lot of people from christie's hong kong new york and london and trying to understand more about the business what exactly is an auction house um, finally, I'm convinced, you know, there's no other time that I should take up this opportunity. This is very unique. If I'm going to switch to another industry similar to finance, it's not worth it because it would not be that different. Um, but auction um, art, it would be totally different. And I thought, why don't I just give it a try? If it doesn't work, I can always come back to banking. Well, that is certainly um, 
that's definitely a pivot and certainly motivational that um, at any point in your career, you can pick up and be thoughtful and go in a different direction. Um, I'm sure you never thought when you were sitting in the art humanities class as part of the core curriculum that this you would be at Christie's knowing more about art than you ever thought you would know. So you obviously have been a successful business leader and made the transition from the financial sector, corporate advisory, mergers and acquisitions. What do you think really prepared you for your role at Christie's? Um, when I first started at Christie's, I was actually very, very nervous. I, as as you said, I think the only proper or some academic, you know, um, courses I've taken was the core curriculum at Columbia, where I took one or two art classes, and that's about it. And I know nothing about the auction house. Um, but I would say after I started three months into my job. I figure out that a lot of things are actually very similar. Although finance and auction house seems there is nothing in common, but they do. Um, it's a business where you serve a group of clients. Um, you may be selling different products, but it's the same type of thinking. How do you grow your business? Um, you know, where is the next growing market? How are you getting closer touch with your customers? How are you going to grow your customer base? How do you make your financials better? How do you deploy your capital? And how do you train and develop the talent in your industry? And all these things that I have done in the past, in the last 28 years, although the industry is totally different. So I have a lot of things to learn when I first joined Christie's. I need to learn all the jargons. I need to learn the name of the artist. Um, and especially in Asia, we have a lot of, you know, Chinese artists and Chinese history is not my strong suit, I have to tell you. So um, I have to relearn everything, you know, about Chinese history, the different dynasties and different artists around the world. Um, but those are easy things to pick up. You know, you, you can really learn about all these things by searching on the Internet, by talking to people, by attending galleries. Um, but I think the discipline, the judgment, the financial acumen, and the soft skills in terms of working with people and communicating with people. Those are all the skills that I have learned in the last 28 years um, that have enabled me to transition into my role at Christie's very, very smoothly. So Heidi, um, when you transitioned, you saw that the processes, whether strategic planning um, or looking at return on investment or impact of initiatives, there were similarities. What was the surprise? There must be, you know, there have to be some differences between the two industries that may have um, caught you off guard or made you have to pivot. Yeah. So for banking, I would say our clients are mostly corporate. And for the clients that deal with even at the corporate, um, they will be very um, experienced people who have been in the industry or in the corporate for a while already. But when I come to Christie's, it's more a retail business. Although the client base is actually quite similar because it could be the same people I worked with, but you know, in the past they represent the corporate, but now when they come to auction, they actually represent themselves because they are buying arts for themselves as their own hobby, they're a collector. And also we're dealing with a lot more younger people here than in the past. In the financial industry, I think, you know, if you're dealing with the CEO or CFO or very senior executives, um, they would be, you know, probably working, you know, in their respective industry for 20 or even more years. But looking at our industry, actually, one of the most important buyers um, for us is actually millennials. And in fact, we have to groom the millennials into our even more important collectors in the future. So the planning in terms of dealing with a client or how to groom our clients and connecting with our clients is a much, much wider range of age and also a longer term planning as compared to the finance industry. Interesting. So there's certainly the internal aspect managing um, the staff and the efforts in putting together auctions. But then there's also that external aspect of client services. Um, and that certainly is multi-generational. So Heidi, um, and we certainly see this at um, the Columbia Alumni Association, which 
Uh, for those of you listening, you're not aware, um, Columbia, as all of you know, has been around till, since 1754. At the same time, the Columbia Alumni Association, which brings together all 17 schools of the university, was only founded in 2005. Um, and one of the things that we look at, whether it's the Columbia Alumni Association Board or our staff in university alumni relations, is finding that balance of being part of a historic institution, but also being new and finding innovation. So you've played a key, key excuse me, you've played a key role in innovating Christie's approach to Asian and world art and its market. How do you find the balance and the need for innovation with respect to the tradition in such a historic institution as Christie's? Mm, yeah, and I, I think one of the most um, or, or the fastest development or innovation we have made actually came because of COVID. Um, in the past, all the options uh, will be in physical form or we call them the live sale. So people will attend the auction in person. They will hold a paddle when they would like something, they will raise the paddle and to bid for an item. And obviously we couldn't do any of that during COVID. It, it was difficult. And uh, even at times where you know people were able to go out because of the different government regulations, we're just not able to have so many people, people in the same room. And uh, so we have to thought of things that we need to do in order to continue our business and uh, still able to connect people around the world. Um, so within that period, I think we probably have done the largest transformation in the shortest periods of time is to change everything from a live sale into online. So we hold a virtual um, auctions uh, where we have bidders from all around the world. Um, they will be able to bid either by telephone um, they will be able to do it online. So they will be sitting, you know, at home and pressing a button on the computer. And then in the auction room, we can see, oh, there is someone from the United States, you know, bidding. Oh, next will be a bid from Australia. Next one will be a bid from Brazil. It's truly bringing all the bidders from around the world. And also, um, you are not going to miss all these uh, vigor and excitement because you're not in the room, because you will be able to see the cell on screen, just like when you and I are talking to each other. And we will have very glamorous um, you know, display on screen. So although you may not have people around you, but you can still really get involved in the option as if you are attending a live cell. This is truly a transformation because um, we were able to continue our business and in fact, it becomes a 24-7 hour business because in the past, if we have an auction in Asia and if you are a collector in America and you're interested in this piece, you will need to fly all the way from America to look at the piece, um, to participate in the bidding. And obviously, you will really enjoy hanging out with your co the collectors from around the world and meet in person. But if there will be an auction happening at the same time in Florida, let's say you want to attend Art Basel, you can't do it. You can't split yourself to be in Florida and in Hong Kong doing an auction at the same time. So having these online bidding will actually make you able to do everything. You will be able to doing this you know, webinar with me at the same time, but you probably an hour later, you will be getting on the phone or doing a bidding in Hong Kong online as well. So we will be able to bring collectors from all over the world to participate in the auction. I think that is the largest transformation. We always wanted to do it, but then COVID actually has accelerated and we were forced to do it quicker and better. Yes, as everyone often says, certainly don't waste a crisis and certainly Christie yeah. has not. Um, on a side note, have you ever thought of being an auctioneer or maybe you are a trained auctioneer? No, not yet. Actually, um, I'm trying to sign up um, and then I am trying to do some training. It's actually a very long training um, and I think I will want to do it and that's on my checklist. So I think if I've been a banker, I've been in auction business, if I have been an auctioneer, I think that would be it. You know, I think I've done everything that I want in my life. Yes, but I'm planning to do it. Oh, well, you'll certainly have to let us know. So Heidi, with your extensive experience, how do you see the art market evolving globally? Um, certainly you talked about 
you know, being able to participate in an auction. Um, but what are you seeing overall in the art world and the growing influence of Asian art and certainly collectors? Mm. Um, I think art is a very new thing in Asia and especially in certain parts of Asia. Um, if you're looking at, for example, Japan or Southeast Asian, um, I think the art business is more developed. And especially in Korea, Korea art is getting very, very popular in different forms. Um, but art in China is a very new thing. Um, but the number of um, Asian collectors have increased dramatically, I would say, in the last 10 years. Um, and we will see this number to continue to increase as the lifestyle of people are changing and people are getting more and more exposure to different types of art from around the world. Um, but I would say in the last 12 months, we also see a slight sort of decline um, because of the economy. And also, I guess, you know, same as everywhere in the world, um, the amount of auction um, has sort of softened a little bit. Um, but we believe this is just temporary. And when the economy is getting better, um, I think these people will come back. And this decline is not, not just in Asia, but also from the rest of the world as well. Um, but if we are talking about maybe some statistics, um, if you think about 10 years ago, um, the amount of auction or the amount of bidding provided or given by Asian buyers 10 years ago would be less than 10%. But in the last two years, the amount of bidding and Christie's from Asia amount to 30% or more. So that showed how dramatic or how significant um, Asian collectors um, has increased over the last 10, 20 years. In terms of artists, um, I think it is most of the art. Well, you, I, I think there are two periods. There is always a very long history of arts in Asia, especially in China, right? Those are the classical type of art. But in terms of the contemporary art, I think there are a lot of up and coming and very talented Asian artists as well, uh, especially in Korea, in China, as well as in India. Um, they're very young and very talented. Um, and I think their names are getting out in the world and we believe that this will continue to grow as well. So we're doing also a lot of marketing to help these young artists so that they can become more popular in the world. And for the new art, what medium are they using? Oh, very, very innovative, um, ranging from traditional type of material or media, even to um, all the digital arts that we talked about nowadays. Wonderful. So what advice would you give to those who are looking to build a, a career at the intersection of art, finance, and management? Are there dis decisions based on your journey that you would suggest that they consider? If you are very interested in art, I would say take some art courses. I didn't do any of those, and definitely I wish I had done that. Um, that will make my transition even better. And I will be able to connect with my colleagues, our specialists and our clients even more. So I think definitely, you know, attend more galleries, go to all the museums and keep yourself, you know, abreast of all the news in the arts industry. Um, but for art, they are very different. It's a big ecosystem. You have the museum, you have the galleries, and you have, you know, people like us, the auction houses. And I think the ecosystem, they all have different role. For example, if you want to be in the museum and it will be a little bit more academic, if you want to be a gallery, then it would be sort of a balance of your art knowledge as well as business and financial. And if you want to work in an auction house, remember auction house is not just about art. We are actually like any corporate. We have a finance division, we have a legal division, we have accounting division. And then, of course, we have all the art specialists. Then you have to decide, you know, which part you want to go in. So, for example, I have a lot of colleagues. They love art, but they do not want to be a specialist. They want to be involved in the art industry. So we have lawyers who decided to come from a law firm and join us to do law in a legal department. But then it's good for them because they feel like they are getting in touch with art every day while they are still 
using what they have learned at law school and continue to be a lawyer. We have accountants and then we have finance people, you know, coming to our house, not to be a specialist, but to be involved in art. So you have to decide which area you want to get involved in. You do not necessarily have to be an artist or you have an art major. You can still come and work in the art industry. That's a really good point because sometimes you automatically go to, um, well, I have no art experience, but I really appreciate that. And um, for those of you who are listening, we have a CAA arts access program. Um, and in fact, we um, are uh, would love to get a tour of Christie's, certainly in Hong Kong. Hope We hope to be in Hong Kong in the summer and maybe even in New York. But it's a great program because it not only connects those who are working in the arts, whether they're promoting their work or they're in the business of art, but it's also for those of us who appreciate the arts um, and want to celebrate Colombians working in the arts. So whether it's going to shows or galleries, so um, you can be part of that program and go and go to events and shows. Um, it's not just for those that are working up in the um, arts. And I see that in the chat, um, there's the link to sign up for um, the communications um, because we go to operas and ballets and galleries um, and uh, maybe even Christie soon. So I, th I think we're going to open it up to questions soon. Um, so feel free um, to put any questions in the chat and Cassandra's going to help me with that. Um, but um, can you talk about how we're communicating with the next um, new and next generation of buyers? Um, very different way. <laughs> First of all, it's definitely not by email. <laughs> it will be through all different forms of media, Instagram, you know, all the social media, but not by email, not by WhatsApp. And um, they, they think very differently. And um, we, we get in touch with them in very different ways as well. Um, the type of things they like is different from the type of things a traditional collectors like. So what we do is we actually have... Um, um, the young collectors coming in, for example, to start on wine first. Um, they will do wine, they do watches and maybe handbags. And later on, they will move on to jewelry. And then later on, they may be moving on to bigger items like paintings, contemporary and things like that. Um, and the young generation also like arts by having more interaction with other collectors. Um, it's almost like a social event for them to, where people of the same interest will gather together to talk about us and to appreciate and go around to galleries. So, and also we have a Christie education program where we actually started educating even very young children. So what we do is we have special program where we bring, you know, the young children to museum. We even have like, you know, they will come to our exhibition. Um, they will draw in front of the paintings. Uh, they come with the parents. We believe that when the children come and see these things when they're very young, they will start to spark an interest in them. And I think also a lot of them, they have seen the parents maybe collecting, but they don't really understand what it is about. So the younger they start, uh, the, the the more they can get into it and you know the faster that they will love this as well. Um, so we do a lot of these programs because a lot of people will have a misperception. Oh, when you go into an auction house, you probably have to spend 10 millions of dollars. It's only for like certain type of people. It's, it is really not true. We we'll welcome everybody. We have things, you know, that will cater for everybody. In fact, you can just come to the auction and view all the properties and view all the art pieces. We will have maybe five Monet and four Picasso in the same exhibition, probably more than a museum will be holding at one point in time. So I think everybody should just come to our exhibition to look at the display and to look at all the items in there. And I can guarantee that you will be a very, very enjoyable experience. I have visited the Christie's New York um, space and it is, it's a mini museum. You walk in, it's free. Uh, there's a little cafe in front and I have seen some amazing um, pieces of art. So I encourage others to join as well. So Heidi, some questions have come in. I'm gonna combine um, these first two. Um, what are your thoughts about AI co-generated art 
And could you share some thoughts on NFT and is there any opportunity combining traditional art industry and the new technology? Yeah, um, AI is a big topic. Um, we are also evaluating how to incorporate AI into our daily work. In fact, we are creating a program that we are going to uh, train all the colleagues at Christie's as to how to use AI. Um, I think some people will think, oh, we shouldn't use AI because it is too robotic. It is not in including any um, real human sort of um, um, addition interaction. Uh, but we think actually AI will be able to help us to do our job more efficiently. For example, especially we have to do a lot of research on different art pieces. And so AI is going to bring um, a lot of more accuracy and efficiency into it. Um, However, I think AI will not be able to replace everything. Um, I'm not sure whether you have this experience. Um, when you call a bank nowadays, I mean, it really irritates me. I could never get to talk to someone. You will always get to this phone line and say, you have to press one, two, three, four. You thought that you press one, you'll get to talk to someone. And then there will be another three questions. And then you answer one of those questions at the end, they will still divert you to a hotline or like a robot to talk to and give you some standard answer. And at Christ we at Christie's believe that uh, that would not be getting really in touch with clients. You really need to have that human interaction. So AI will only be able to replace certain parts of our work. But at the end, I think the human interaction and our face-to-face -face, um, tailor-made solution to our client is what distinguish us from our competitors. Um, so we are going to hold, you know, this to this will be our strategy going forward. And I hope that, you know, anyone who would have a question for us will be able to talk to us instead of talking to a robot or, you know, talking to a chat box, you know, who would give you standard answers. Now, NFT is a very interesting thing. Um, if you remember about 18 months ago, NFT was actually very, very popular. We sold a very good painting uh, called 5,000 Days by Beeples, and it was sold for $58 million. And it was about 18 months ago when crypto was still very, very popular. But I have to say nowadays, um, crypto, because crypto is no longer very popular, uh, NFT is also getting a little bit quiet. But it doesn't mean that digital art is not popular. OK, we're still doing a lot of digital art with digital artists coming from everywhere around the world. But when we do digital arts, we no longer link it to cryptocurrency because crypto is not the most popular at this moment. But if you have heard it in the news in the last two weeks, they say that the crypto is coming back. You know, for the last 12 months, the crypto is coming to, you know, one of the highest points. So who knows? Maybe it will come back. But crypto is one thing. Digital art is a completely different thing. And we believe that all sort of artists, whether they use it on paper, on, on wood, or whether they use a digital form of, of art, they can still artist, and the art is the most precious things of the world. Thank you. Yes, I, I saw that a while back about that NFT. Um, and I think definitely was looking up, okay, what exactly is an NFT? And... Um, the definition and um, many articles about that. So um, thank you for sharing. Since you've been at Christie's, have your family and friend groups become more involved in arts and visiting Christie's and galleries? Definitely. In fact, um, we were just hosting um, a tour of uh, alumni at the Columbia University Hong Kong Alumni Association. They came to our exhibition we just finished two weeks ago. Um, Definitely friends and families are getting more involved in attending gallery events. And we have a new museum called M Plus in Hong Kong. Not sure you have heard about it. We also have a Hong Kong Palace Museum, uh, which is the same as the Beijing Palace Museum. It's a Hong Kong branch. So all these things becoming a more, um, I would say, um, daily life of me and also my friends and my family. Um, but in general, I think Hong Kong is becoming... Uh, more into arts. The government is trying to build Hong Kong into an art hub. So for any of you who will be coming to Hong Kong in the near future, please give me a ring. I will be very happy, you know, if we have an exhibition going on, we'll have all the specialists to give you a private tour, or we can go to M Plus or the Hong Kong Palace Museum together. There are a lot of art events going on in Hong Kong. And for Art Basel, we have it on an annual basis in March. So please come at the same time as well. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for the invite. Um, 
So what's a good way to follow and stay in touch with Christie's? Um, there was an alum who has said, I'm new to art and the idea of collecting um, and wants to stay connected. Okay. Um, please, you know, I'm very happy to, you know, to, to be in touch with anyone who would like to know more about Christie's. Um, I'm happy to share my contact as well, or maybe Donna can share my contact with these alumni later. Um, but in general, you know, you can go onto our website, christies.com, and in the website, you will be able to find all the events that is hosted by us around the world. You will be able to see the schedule of all the live sale going to happen in the next few months, also the online sale as well. Um, we will also have uh, pictures and photos of all the important art pieces that will be coming into our sale. Um, sometimes we will also have artists um, writing pieces or research pieces being published online. So it's not just about Christie's, it's also about you know uh, art uh, information in general, uh, but you will find a lot of information on our website. Um, also, please follow us on Instagram. Uh, there was an Instagram for Asia, Christie's called Christie's Asia. Just type it in, you can find us and follow us very easily. What are the plans for incorporating virtual reality, if any? Uh, can, can you elaborate virtual reality in terms of? Um, and the question came in from Francine Glick, one of the um, our alumni from Barnard, who's part of the She Opened the Door community. I'm going to ask uh, Francine to chime in a little bit more of what you're thinking about. But I, I if I understand the, um, the question, um, in fact, you know, like we have to tour the pieces around the world, which is not easy, uh, especially big, big statues. I won't be able to take them from New York and to exhibit in Hong Kong. It's just very, very difficult. But we started to have all these hologram machines actually um, is one of the latest technology. And this machine will be able to display the pieces if it's, it's a virtual image of that pieces, but it's a three-dimensional image. So if you come to an exhibition in Hong Kong, you will be able to see the pieces um, that are actually from New York, but in this hologram machine. It, it looks almost like it is real. Uh, you can go around. The only thing you cannot touch it because it's not a real substance, it's not a real piece, but you'll be able to go around it. It will be in exactly the same size, exactly the same color. You can see even the details of it very, very clearly. So that's one of the virtual things that we do. And it, this is one of the latest technology. I'm not quite sure I would answer the question, but I hope that this is what you meant by virtual reality. Um, so I think um, I think that was great to explain how you get to really un see something that you're not seeing in purpose uh, in person. But I think she's talking more about: is there any artwork with the headsets with virtual reality? What your look? Oh, at? I see it. Yeah. I see. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, yes, we started to do it. Definitely. Uh, we call it immersive experience. Okay. Yes, we do that. Um, uh, it's not very popular yet. I think it's getting more and more popular outside of Asia, but we are definitely looking into it. In fact, we're moving our office um, next year to the new building called the Henderson, which is going to be one of the you know iconic building in Hong Kong. When we move in our gallery, we are planning to have a space just for that. So at this moment, we don't have it yet in Asia, but in the outside of Asia, they have started to do it. And in fact, I think when you go to a lot of the museums in New York or in London, uh, they have all these immersive or virtual you know, experience that you talk about. But it would be getting more and popular, I think. Well, we certainly will stay tuned for that. So a question came in about the master's degree programs um, that and no, that Christie's has one. For somebody who has worked in the finance industry, VC for a few years, and is interested in pursuing specialization in um, alt, um, alternative investments, especially art investment, will these master programs in art and finance be helpful? And how do you compare these art programs to those offered at universities? Mm, I, I think definitely they are very, very helpful. Um, again, you have to get um, very close to latest information of the art industry. I think the master program is more academic 
And whereas, for example, at Christie's Education, the courses we offered is more about the latest market trend. So, for example, we could have a course just on um, the latest or the most popular, maybe a contemporary artist, you know, um, for the last two years. We may have a course just on maybe female artists, you know, uh, for the last uh, 10 years. Um, so the Christie's education program that we provide is more, I would say, uh, to the market. It's not necessarily academic, um, but all the other master programs that you get outside, you know, for other institutions, that's definitely very, very, very valuable and informative. Uh, but I think that would be more towards um, getting more academic knowledge of certain period of arts. So it really depends on what is the purpose of taking these courses. If you are taking it to um, become a specialist in certain uh, art period or certain country, then I would say getting those master courses at a um, university uh, would probably be more appropriate. But if you just want to have some courses uh, so that you can get the latest information of the art industry, then probably you can join one of the Christie's, you know, education courses. Those courses are usually very short. It could be ranging from one week to a few months. Um, some of them can actually be done online at your own pace as well. Um, so I think there are many, many different courses out there that you would find to be interesting. Mm -hmm. And again, you can find all these course information on our website as well. We have a website for Christie's education. You will be able to see all the courses that we offer you know, um, during different periods of time and also around the globe. Wonderful. Question came in, has Christie's considered instituting a system for better serving the artists who made the original work? And have they considered reserving a percentage of sales to go back to the original artists as a form of royalties on the sales made? Yeah, um, actually we, our client is not the artist. Um, actually we're in the secondary market. Um, the galleries are actually the one in the primary market and they deal with the artist directly, but we don't. We're actually in the secondary market, which means that um, maybe someone has already purchased the art from the artist directly, but then we are doing a resale from the person who has already acquired the work. So unfortunately, we'll not be able to do that because we are not in direct you know, touch with the artist. But for galleries, they can do that easily because they are in direct contact with the artist. So I think a lot of people are not aware that we are actually in the secondary business rather in the primary market. Hmm. But I uh, think that's a very, very good idea. So we can think about it. Right. Um, we always hear about the struggling artists, that's for sure. Um, so um, I have two last questions. So um, certainly we have individuals um, who are in different um, phases of their professional career, um, maybe thinking about um, what to do next. Um, what is uh, a piece of advice that you, you haven't shared yet that you think was really important as you navigated your career over the past several decades? Mm. Um, keep learning and keep learning. One thing I found is the market is changing so quick, quickly nowadays. Um, you just have to keep learning new things. And also when you are in the same position or same role for a period of time, your learning curve is going to plateau. And usually there will be a point where you feel that, am I still learning a lot? Should I do something new? When you start to have that feeling, I think your feeling is right. Um, either you have to find, well, you don't have to find a new job. I mean, you just have to talk to your, um, your, your colleagues and to see what are the new things that you can do within the same organization so that you are still learning new things every day. Otherwise, you will find yourself stagnant and one day you feel like you're bored and you don't want to get to that stage. So you just have to keep finding something new, um, even though you think that you have learned everything, but it's not. Actually, there is new things, whether it's within your organization or outside your organization. Um, also connect with, keep doing a lot of connecting with people, whether it's your clients, whether it's your colleagues, and whether it's your peers or even your juniors. Um, you are going to learn a lot from them. In fact, one of the things I have learned is I, I never thought that I would be learning so much from 
my younger colleagues, those who are like 20 years younger than me. But I figure out that they are thinking in a different way. They are doing things in a very different way. Um, and when I talk to them, I actually find that, wow, it's really enlightening. I haven't thought about this. I, I have no idea you guys are actually thinking this way. It's a very different generation. Um, so throughout my career, even nowadays, I actually make a very conscious effort to spend time with very young colleagues. I want to know what they are doing. And every time when I come up from that conversation, I'm like, oh my God, the world has changed. I have no idea. These are things that I would never be able to find out by just reading the news or watching the TV. Um, you have to talk to these people. So I would say throughout your career, keep learning, meeting new people, meeting new people, not necessarily just people you think will be able to help you in your career. Even very young people who are 20 years younger than you, they will be able to tell you what, how the world is going, where the world is going. You will be able to get information from them. And at any point in time when you feel that I'm getting a little bit bored, I don't feel like, you know, I'm going anywhere that's the time that you should get some changes, whether to find a new job or to find a different position in your organization. And uh, that's actually a good thing. I think working on, on the same thing for about three or four years, you will come to this plateau. So it's about time to always do something new every four or five years. I agree with you. And obviously in my role at Columbia, I speak with a lot of students and I always say to them, you have to challenge yourself and that word should not be daunting. It should be um, motivating and invigorating um, because if we're not challenged in our roles, like why bother? So I think that's good advice um, to certainly reflect every couple of years. Like, am I going in the right direction? Am I excited about what I'm doing? So um, one last question, because I know it's it's getting even later. It might be almost time to wake up soon. Um, do you have favorite piece of art or a memorable auction that you want to share that has really stood out in your time at Christie's? Yeah. Um, actually, I was in Paris in June this year. It, it is a very small auction. Um, there was this Buddhist art piece um, that was just auctioned off and some private collector raised the paddle and the you know gavel came down, you know, it's done. And all of a sudden, um, a woman stood up and she was speaking in French. I was very nervous. I was asking my colleague, you know, is there something wrong? Is it because this person is coming to claim this piece because she actually owned this piece? This piece may have been stolen from her. That's why she is contesting and trying to get this piece back because she was looking very, very serious. So she was speaking for like five minutes. I have no idea what she was talking about. And all of a sudden, everybody were just clapping their hands. I was like, okay, at least must be some good news. But what happened? And I found out that actually in France, there is this regulation um, that protect all the museums. So the private collector was able to, you know, auction and, and bid and won the bid to get this piece. But the museum actually think that this is a better piece for them to keep in France and to showcase this to everybody. So the museum all of a sudden stood up and say, you know what, I'm going to take this piece from you. Sorry. This cannot be auctioned to a private collector. This is too important. I want to keep it in the museum. So she stood up and said all these things about why the museum want to keep it. And then she took it away. Wow. Okay. Yes. I think it was so interesting. And I think this regulation is actually so good because they want to put it still, you know, be able to allow the public to view it. I have no idea about this regulation. It was my first time in Paris watching it. I was just nervous when I thought something must be really going wrong, but it's not. It's actually the best thing I've ever seen. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, yes, and you know the artists work so hard and it's wonderful that when we put them in public places that individuals- Yes, see. yes. Um, so Heidi, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, at Columbia and certainly beyond. And um, we're so grateful for you being part of our community um, and staying up late to talk with us and share your thoughts. If anyone's interested in connecting with Heidi, I'm certain you can find her online at Christie's, but, but certainly reach out to us in our office. Um, and I'm going to now turn it over to Cassandra so she can end the program. And once again, Heidi, thank you so much. 
Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Donna and Heidi. That was such a great conversation. I learned so much and Heidi, really, really just great career advice. So thank you for inspiring me and I'm sure all of our other participants who uh, joined. Um, so, and I, thanks for the tip on visiting Christie's in New York City. I will definitely be going in to take a look at the collections. Um, I would also like to thank our She Opened the Door Committee and the CAA for helping make today's conversation such a success. Um, for those of you in the audience, we hope you'll consider volunteering with the CAA to help get fellow alumni and students involved in meaningful initiatives like this. Our next She Opened the Door Ask the Expert virtual event will take place on Friday, January 26th, again at noon. We are also very happy to share with you all that we will be hosting a one-day conference on March 2nd uh, focused on women's health. So do uh, please keep your eyes open for more details on that event uh, in the new year. Uh, as Donna mentioned, you can find more information about our She Open the Door Committee um, at the link in the chat box, which I think will pop in there eventually. Uh, it's also alumni or alumni.columbia.edu. And finally, as Donna mentioned, if you'd like to connect with Heidi or Donna or myself, um, you can do so uh, on LinkedIn or finding us uh, online. So with that, I would want to wish you all a very wonderful rest of your day or night and um, warm and healthy uh, holiday season. So we will see all of you in the new year and thank you again for joining us today.